we'll go ahead and start. So, and again, we can be a bit more casual, just raise your hand if you have questions and so forth. But if you're here, I probably don't need to say why it's a good idea to try to write. But let me just say a few words about that. So um, for every legal job you can possibly want, not just in academe, this is the most significant skill you could have. You may be a lousy reader of law. You may be a lousy interpreter of the law. But if you can't write about it, they don't want to hire you. And so what you will need typically, and what will help you get the most, is something that you have hopefully published. And therefore, for all legal jobs, no matter what it is, whether it's the government, NGO, pub, uh, public defender, prosecutor, what they want is can you synthesize a huge amount of information? Can you read for a purpose and develop it into an analytical piece? Uh, and can you adapt that to different audiences? And so a solid writing sample, uh, and especially one that you've published, is just a great thing to have. It also enables depth of the subject, and it means that if you've written it with said supervision of a professor in law school, the letter of reference you will get from that experience is going to be far more credible than a law professor who says, this person got an A in an exam, and that's all I can say as opposed to having said something about your skill set. So therefore, you can and you should take advantage of your legal education, even if you don't get around to finishing the piece, you turned it in for a class, but you could do it uh, later on. Um, but get something out uh, of your legal experience that you can publish is a worthwhile thing. And therefore, that's why I, I give this talk, and I've given it now in various places. Um, and I think most of the time when people show up, they already are convinced that this is a good idea, so maybe it's not worth saying that much about why it's worth writing. Now, the, the next step is, so how do you do it? Now you're convinced you want to write. Uh, where do you find topics? And the truth is, uh, that it's sort of obvious, but here it is uh, on, uh, on the, on the left-hand side. You can find it everywhere you read the news. You can find it on blogs, podcasts. Uh, for example, the podcast EGIL has the European Journal of International Law. You can find it through an academic conference and ideas. You can find it in working paper series. Uh, we have at NYU various working paper series, including those attached to the International Institute of Law and Justice. Uh, you can get an idea from State Digest of Practice, that is what states say, and here we're talking about international law after all. You can get it from national laws, regulations, and if you've worked in a law firm uh, or in any other capacity, you might get an idea from the actual practice that you've had, an, a, a certain problem that you had to resolve. And of course, you can get it from uh, judicial decisions at various levels, and, uh, and you may get it from uh, even things that are stated in a law firm blog post about an idea that uh, somebody had. And then quasi-judicial outputs, that's his human rights committees, general comments, their recommendations, their views in response to individual complaints. And then uh, from if, uh, other international law outputs, the COPS, uh, for example, climate change, committee of the parties, uh, expert reports produced by UN special rapporteurs, and then of course many people are inspired by simply reading prior scholarship and, and finding that this well-cited article that everybody cites, you now read and you find, well, what a piece of garbage that was. Uh, and why did anybody pay attention in light of certain circumstances? Uh, and that's known in the trade as kill your mentor type scholarship. You take a knife and you destroy uh, a prior, hopefully very eminent law professor's best work uh, by pointing out its flaws in light of subsequent events. Um, and where do you place the scholarship once you get these ideas? Well, there are obvious places like student notes, and that's while you're still a student here. 
you can try to publish in our journals. Uh, and then once the minute you graduate, that student note can turn into a law review article. Uh, and remember, there are various types of articles published in law reviews. They could be essays. They could be book reviews. They could be book review essays. They could be simply case reports uh, outlining the significance of a particular case. You could write something for a practitioner-oriented uh, publication. CCH puts out a bunch of those. Uh, and that could be alongside of how-to material, how to solve antitrust cases using evidence uh, of a particular kind. It could be very, very, uh, very oriented to very specific policy areas. And that's not just useful for somebody else, but also establishes your reputation and skill set in that particular area by publishing such a piece. Now, obviously, a pra practitioner-oriented piece may not get you uh, to some things that you want to aspire to. So a practitioner-oriented piece is not going to get you a, law, a, a job as a law professor, but it may get you the next law firm gig, or it may get you the general counsel slot uh, because of that publication. You could publish something as a policy report that has more data than law in it. Say if you're working for a human rights NGO, you do a, a, a very uh, interesting report on uh, the problem with unlawful detention in country X, and you put out all this data, it shows uh, a considerable skill in amassing a, a great deal of data, uh, even though it may not show as much about the law. And then if you're the old-fashioned type, especially in Europe, uh, you can contribute to a treatise, or you can contribute to one of those really old-fashioned stuff, public encyclopedias of international law where you write a little short blurb on uh, some legal term of art. If you are doing a master's thesis or a PhD or an SJD dissertation, now you're talking a bit more ambition, uh, and therefore you may be publishing a book as a result at the one end, uh, or a series of book chapters or a series of articles based on that. Now, what is the difference between a master's thesis and a, a PhD? I'll give you Joseph Weiler definition. Joseph Weiler, definition of master's level scholarship. A piece that shows the author's mastery over a subject by synthesizing all that has been written on the topic. So you become the master of the universe and you synthesize everything on that. And perhaps you take a slightly different perspective on that synthesis, having to put it all together. The PhD, according to Weiler, addresses a question or an issue that the field has not addressed before, shows the field what it did not know. Now you become Weiler's god at that. Okay? That's obviously very ambitious. Uh, but at least it gives you a sense of the difference between different levels of scholarship. Here at NYU, we do offer the possibility of a master's thesis, almost no one does it, uh, in part because you already have had to do a considerable amount of work before you get here as an LLM in order to do it. But we strongly advise people to be a little slightly less ambitious and maybe do a two-credit paper in connection with a seminar that you eventually will expand into an article, perhaps, uh, later on. So that's, that's the, the types of scholarship uh, and where you find it. Let me just expand uh, one, on one point. And that's, these days, you have more than the usual venues. You have law reviews, you have books, and so forth. You have social media of various kinds. You have NGOs, you have think tank websites, you have law firm websites, you have university websites. In this school, we have websites attached to many of our centers and, uh, and other institutes. And you have specialized media, including online fora, Agile Talk, Agile Unbound, Just Security. Uh, security, Opino Juris, just to name some of the more famous ones on this side of the Atlantic. And podcasts and even videos, I'm tempted to say, you could probably do something in the TikTok area, but I'm not a specialist on that subject. So the other thing I want to highlight is this little piece, which uh, Joseph Weiler wrote some time ago, a very famous piece, some would call it infamous piece, on Publish and Perish. 
The point is that he was warning people that if you are, and he was basically focusing on PhDs, but I think the point is more general. He was saying that there's a huge amount of pressure to publish, and therefore, you are tempted to publish uh, perhaps parts of your PhD before you're finished. And he was warning people in that piece not to do that uh, because it will be premature, you haven't thought it through, and that you will publish and perish. That is, as a result of getting a piece out before its time. That is applicable, I think, more generally in the following sense, according to me which is before you publish, workshop that piece so that it is as good as possible. So you don't perish because you published it. That is, it's hard to get rid of a piece once you publish it. It is there. It's like one of those embarrassing college pictures that somehow you can't extract from the internet. And then you become a VP candidate and you have to live with somebody staring at you drunk on the college floor. You don't want to be responsible for a piece that you have to apologize for later on. But where I disagree with him is that if you're a PhD candidate and you want to get shortlisted for a job, I think you will inevitably publish a portion of your PhD. That is necessity. And therefore, most publishers will agree that uh, you can still publish your PhD with them as a book even if you publish a chapter or two as an article before then. And also you will probably change it in one form or another. So I think that uh, Weiler is being a little, uh, a little unrealistic to say we should just stay there, sit there still for three to five years and not publish a thing and suddenly publish the best book in the world and you'll get a law job. That's not the way the world works. They expect to see something concrete uh, and presentable as you are interviewing. Okay, so what is more important about the media these days, the social media outlets that I've just described is the following. These days you are in a golden age. It's like the Netflix of legal publishing. You can take an idea that you have and you publish it first and own it as a short tweet. Then a longer blog post, and then a slightly even longer blog post for 1,000 to 3,000. Then you take a portion of the idea and you put it in a public policy journal or in a think tank report. And then before you publish it, you put it on SSRN, which is a free gift to the legal academic, uh, and you get the piece out before it is final, and most publishers don't have a problem with that and then uh, you then publish the final article, book, chapter, or if you're really good, a book. And then you spin off, you rinse, and you repeat the same idea in various forms for the rest of your life. Because, and this I'm not being facetious here, most of us have only two or three great ideas in our lifetime. And if you pierce even some of the biggest scholars in the field, they may have 100 articles, but maybe four core ideas that are spin through in various ones of this spin cycle of laundry, laundry slash scholarship. And so this is the world where the value of this is that you own it before you publish it by publishing it as a tweet. And then you can point to some plagiarist to say, look, I, in 1989, I put that idea out, and now you're trying to claim it for yourself. Um, but also, you develop it over time so that you get more mature about the idea. You're connected to different events in the world over time. Um, to get a sense of the progress of ideas, you can go to Angel Unbound, and in Angel Unbound on the web, Angel Unbound is connected to the American Journal of International Law. It's its web design. Uh, Benedict Kingsbury and I created Angel Unbound, we're proud to say, when we were co-editors in chief. And at that time and through, uh, I think, the current year, it's mostly symposia. That is, somebody gets an idea for commissioning five pieces on X 
topic, and then they get people to write about it. You can get a sense of the symposia. Right there is just a list of the symposia. And now it's Agile and Bound has been around for quite some time. So there's quite a number of symposia. By the way, the symposia themselves are great ideas for topics. And uh, because they're short, they're 3,000 word symposia. Now Agile and Bound is expanding what it's doing so that it doesn't have to be a symposia. And, and as I understand, what they'll do is they'll, they'll ask for solicitation of various types of articles. They don't have to all be 3,000 words in part of a group collection, but they could be book reviews. They could be something else. I don't know, ultimately, how they will define themselves to be different from Agil, except that I assume that it will be shorter and more timely and somewhat less prestigious authors, perhaps, or at least younger authors from a great variety of places. In fact, one of the assets of Agile Unbound is that uh, within the first five years or so, there were 200 people published in Agile Unbound who had never published in Agile, the main journal. And so it was uh, really a, quite an opportunity to provide not, them, not just them, but also an opportunity for Agile to diversify. The board of Agile, the editorial board of Agile, we'll mention that in a minute, is completely different than it was when I first came on the board uh, back in the 90s. Um, at that time, the board consisted of basically East Coast and a handful of West Coast schools, the most prestigious one on the US News and World Report, and all white males from those schools publishing mostly themselves and their best friends, okay? Uh, in an endless cycle of the latest article by Tom Frank and Reisman, and you name them. They just kept going and going in a very small circle of, of elite group. Now, if you look at the journal, just click it on. If you have your computer, you will see a very different journal, and I'll mention that in a minute. The other thing that is part of this process of having a lot of media and connections to analytical analysis and data is that you have this, the impact of social media. So on many of these, if you do it as a posting or exists only on the web, like Angel Unbound, it is connected to algorithmic uh, systems where if you click on a particular piece, and I'm sure some of you have done it, it looks something like this on the web, where it gives you a sense of how popular the piece is, who has downloaded it around the world, incredible amount of data of who's reading it in, in a short amount of time, uh, and the members of the public versus scientists versus uh, particular countries that have looked at this and mentioned by news outlets, another blog post, policy source, 129 tweeters have mentioned uh, this particular piece, and so forth. And that gives you a sense of how popular a particular topic is, not just how popular you are if you've written it, which also gives you a sense of what things are hot topics to write about, and where in the world are they interested in those topics. So you have almost too much data now that can be influential, and also a lot of data once you publish in those journals about who is reading you, uh, as, and, and they even do go as far, which could be very discouraging, ranking the article versus other articles in the journal, so this particular article is number one uh, in the first uh, output from the American Journal. Um, and it has outputs of a similar age, 3,000 of them, uh, et cetera. So you really get a sense of whether this piece was read and whether the idea, for example, is worth rinsing and repeating. Right? You get a sense, oh, well, this has legs. I better go with this uh, and, and develop it further couple more uh, points. Some of you 
are not as familiar with US law journals and their particular idiosyncrasies. So uh, those of you who are JDs, you can fall asleep during this part. But it's basically we have a lot of them, a lot of journals. You have no idea how many journals. But at NYU, just to give you a sense, there are 10 student edited journals, three faculty journals, that means peer reviewed, four blog posts listed, but actually many more if you go through these centers and institutes, and each, many of them have their own blog posts. At Columbia, just up the street, 14 student edited journals. Multiply that by approximately 200 law schools, and you will understand why if you write your idea on the back of a napkin, it will be published. Which means that you will perish by it if you're not careful. In other words, it is too easy to be published in a student edited journal in the United States because they're all desperate for material. And they have to fill those pages. And their students, they have no idea whether your piece is any good. If it reads well, and it sounds like you're in a fairly respectable law school, and your name is preceded by the word professor, oh my god, they will publish somewhere. And so most of these are student edited, not peer reviewed. Yes? I have a question for clarification. So all school Oh, can you click? Oh. Yeah, so I can hear. So all student um, journals in the US are not peer reviewed at all? So, uh, so you see that most of them are not peer reviewed. There are a handful that are peer reviewed, and it is especially peer reviewed if it's outside of law, a political science journal. The American Journal of International Law is peer reviewed, so is the European Journal of International Law, and in fact in Europe it's far more common that they are peer reviewed. And peer reviewed means that the, the people who are judging uh, your, your article for admission are, are academics or senior practitioners. They're not students. Now, what you need to also understand is that because there are so many uh, journals, you need to uh, figure out uh, what they're looking for. And because of the specialty nature of these 10 student edited journals, you have to look at their journal web pages to be sure that what you're writing coincides with what they're interested in because otherwise you're just wasting your time and theirs. They generally accept articles, but this also you check in the web pages uh, during these two periods, February to April, and then August to September, when they fill their pages for the next year. So those are typically the windows, but there are exceptions to that rule. There's also a process where you can have this easily done through the magic of Expresso or Scholastica, where they will send it to the journals you indicate. And far more frequently, many people would just say, send them to all journals, which means that no one screens it for whether it's appropriate to send it to the journal, the NYU Journal of International Law and Politics suddenly gets a tax piece because they've just used Expresso, which means that a great deal of time is wasted in these journals on just discarding stuff that is just not appropriate by subject matter. So you can cut that off a little bit by being a bit more selective in where you send it, although given the hundreds of journals you're talking about, you can't blame somebody for using Expresso. And then there, there is the magic and the tension with the process, playing the game. So. Because you have these magical systems to submit, there is no rule among student edited journals that you have to submit exclusively to one journal. What happens is you send them all, and then one of the journals you never heard of, because it's at a school you didn't even know existed, in the middle of a state you didn't ever stop in because it's a flyover place, says, we're interested in your piece you get an email. And that's when you play the game. 
You then go to the Harvard Law Review and you say, I have an exception. Are you interested in my piece? And that's how the better journals basically operate. They have this stack of articles they've never gotten to, and they're just waiting for somebody to tell them where in the stack is something that might be a jewel. Now, of course, the Harvard Law Review might actually ask you, where were you accepted? <laughs> where? Uh, no, thank you very much. Now, if you happen to say the Yale Law Review, you probably aren't bothering Harvard to begin with, right? But that's how you try to go up, because sometimes a journal will respond. Now, the game has been cut short a bit, because the lower ranked journals know the game. And so they'll say, you have 72 hours to accept our exploding offer, which means you have a very limited time to play this game. But some journals don't, because you're so desperate for material. And that's where you try to elevate your ranking. Now, let me say, I am not sure that it's really worth that much time to be sure you are in a slightly better student-edited journal. If the thing is published and it's accessible on high online, then it's published. And if you're using it to, say, get a job somewhere, is the quality of the piece that should matter, not where it's published. But yes, on the margin, it might get some more eyes on it if it's in a prestigious school, which is basically how you judge these journals. If you want an entertaining, totally irreverent version of what I just said with a lot of funnier lines, go to that website and you'll see a Q&A uh, very ironic about this process and, and somewhat cynical about it, which is deservedly so, because it is a bit of a ridiculous process. Now, a little more on journals. So you should do your homework on a journal. So how do you do that? Say it's the American Journal of International Law. You go to its website, you will find a ton of information that is relevant to the journal. Yes. Yeah, um, so I'm the articles editor on the Law Review uh, for NYU, so I feel like a lot of what you're saying very much resonates. Like, we get, like, a million extra requests from, like, schools that we don't even know exist. Um, sometimes, like, we kind of just, like, brush over the expedite request as if it doesn't exist because it's just, like, what are you even talking about? But I think what's interesting as an articles editor who's interested in international law, like, one of my main goals being an articles editor and, like, going through like screening like hundreds of articles was like publishing an international law article on the law review. And it was very, very difficult given the fact that like law reviews specifically are seen as like the more prestigious journals. At the same time, they're the ones who are like supposed, supposedly for like a generalist audience who doesn't have to have a certain background in anything. So international law pieces were very hard for me to push through the articles committee because they would be like very specific and talking to people who had that initial background so in national like law. Main law yes. 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 Yeah. So for example, the NYU Law Review is our main journal, and it's not devoted to international law, but it could publish. It. Yes. So the only piece that I got them to publish was Una Hathaway. And that was like the only person I could convince them because Who she happens ha to have her name attached to Yale Law School. Exactly. Uh, and everyone else kind of like got discarded because they were just like, we don't understand what this is talking about. So I'm wondering if you could kind of like shed some insight into like being more palatable to law review or like generalist audiences while still like maintaining like your arguments in international law. So that's a hard one because I think it does connect them to doing your homework. Because if you do your homework, you might see something. And here I'm talking more, of course, the peer review ones. Uh, because then you'll see the backgrounds of who are going to judge your piece. So if you go to the American Journal of International Law, you will encounter the list of board of editors, which looks like this. Uh, and you can actually see that there are 28 editors and then a bunch of folks who used to be at the top but then got to be 65 and then they were dumped to the bottom. Uh, and then they're still reviewing, so they're still relevant. Uh, but the real people who count are the 28. But I think your question is really hard to answer because 
it depends what you're competing with at that moment, right? So they could decide, just because the student editor-in-chief took an international law course, or because the articles person is interested in that particular topic, that suddenly an international law piece is booked from them. They, and you will see an occasion of a, a mainline law review publishing that. So I don't think I have particular advice on how to penetrate the process. But I think you can make at least a cover letter explain the significance of the piece in a way that even an idiot would understand with no background in international law. The reason this is important is because the following issues are happening in the world, whatever it is, right? Or connected to existing scholarship written by famous people uh, that they would recognize and why it connects to their work. Or connected to what they have published in the past that deals with this, even if it's not a totally international law piece, right? You publish this, this makes some sense, you have a history on this. Of course, student edited journals are not bound by what their predecessors ever did. So it really does matter a great deal sort of happenstance. But getting back to doing your homework. So if you look at the age old website, what you will discover is the 28 people who are now editors-in-chief are from a variety of schools, not just the ones on the coast. They include Florida International, Shenhua, University of New South Wales, Wake Forest University, Johns Hopkins, Temple University, University of Maryland, University of Iowa, Washington University in St. Louis, and on and on it goes. More importantly, by my count, some 10 of the 28 are critical, twail adjacent scholars. Scholars who, I, I hope you recognize the, the phrasing here, third world approaches of international law. Third world approaches to international law claim to see the law from a perspective of the global south, mostly from scholars who are comfortably ensconced in the global north, but came from the global south and were trained in the global north so there's some doubt about whether they represent the views of the global south, but they purport to care about the global south, and that's what matters. And so there are various types of crits, and now we have a growing amount of scholarship on critical legal history of international law, which is the emphasis on colonialism and its effects through today, racism and its effects today, to international law. I mention this because given such a huge presence, and this is a big change from say 20 years ago on the journal, then you would expect that in the future the AGIL will be publishing more critical pieces on international law uh, that deviate from its past given these people. The other thing that has changed is a gender parity or close to it compared to the white male approach, so that we now have, for the first time in the journal's history, two female co-editors in chief, one from Columbia, one from Vanderbilt, and a considerable interest in, at least among the 28, on gender critiques of international law, for instance. So that is also quite different. What is also interesting is that the journal, even though it's called the American Journal of International Law, now has a few representatives of the world in it. I mentioned uh, uh, Shenhua, so you know that there's a Chinese scholar. There are a few Western European scholars on the journal, uh, and I think you would expect uh, that there will be even more over time. What you will also find in, if you look at Angel Unbound website, is instructions for authors. And that is invaluable because it will tell you uh, exactly what they expect for each section of the American Journal. If you have an article exceeding 30,000 words, don't even bother to send it to them. But 30,000 words is a very long piece. So that's quite generous. But it also means that it's quite unlikely they will take a 5,000 word lead article. So you know the range here. 
Essays and current developments are 11,000 words. Book reviews are a maximum of 5,000. Book review essays, which mean more than one book being reviewed in more. Uh, group setting are up to 8,000. International decisions, that is a summary with maybe three paragraphs on the significance of a decision, not necessarily by an international court, but even national courts at the very highest level, the Supreme Court of a country that has dealt with an international law issue that could be of interest to the journal, that would be something you could cover and turn in for 3,500 words. And you could have various of those decisions, decision essays, for 8,000 words. You cannot submit an editorial comment to AJO unless you are on the board of editors, so don't waste your time with that. And you cannot submit a piece on US contemporary practice of international law because that's written by the section editor of that piece. But all the other things and those word limits are very important. AGIL, like many journals, is also adopting two open access policies where you can make the article available for either a limited time or for the planet, but you have to pay money uh, to make it available because this is a commercial publisher. So it, the fee could be quite steep, uh, but in some cases your institution will pay for it if you are, say, in an academic institution. Uh, and They'll pay the $10,000 fee to have open access. Often, by the way, you may be approached once you're in the academy or in a, in a particular group by someone who has uh, a guarantee from some foundation that what they'll publish is open access, in which case you know that if you publish in that particular journal uh, on this topic, your, your piece will be open access, and that's great because then you know that everyone uh, who's interested might see it. What you will also see on the journal website is it'll tell you who the editors are of Angel Unbound. And this, uh, this is the supervising editors are Julia Narato, Iyad Benvenisti, Alexandra Guneas, Katrina Linos, and, and Makati Sirleaf. And they are the people you would approach with ideas for Angel Unbound. And so you can find uh, all of this information there, uh, and it's very, very useful, uh, including the open access uh, policies. Um, any questions on, on these websites? Obviously, some websites may give you more information than others. So what happens when you submit to something like Angel or Angel? So this is the, and asked, by the way, if you won't see this on the website, I had to extend the information by interviews uh, with uh, the respective editors. And they weren't uh, totally happy with, uh, with giving me the information, but they could hardly complain uh, because they have some commitment to transparency. But the bottom line, as you see there, if you go there, it does take a lot to get acceptance through EJOP. You have, um, you have a, a, a process where the two editors-in-chief of EGIL, one of whom is Joseph Weiler, um, and three associate editors who are usually very senior uh, uh, PhD students, are reading everything that comes through the door, and they're guaranteed a decision of whether they're going forward with full peer review within six weeks. You have to sit tight for six weeks. And in that, by that way, during that process, you could be submitting to lots of other places. But if um, they decide that, yes, they're going to submit it to a good, what the usual process is a double blind, where the reviewers don't know who you are, and you don't know who they are, and what they do is the article is extracted of as much information as they can, including footnotes that would reveal who you are. And then uh, if you're told that it is going within those six weeks to this, then they'll extract a, a concession from you that you would be drawing the article from consideration every other place. Um, and what you get, even if you're ultimately rejected, which is not a bad thing, is a lot of comments from the peer review process. That even if they reject it, will, I guarantee you, be very helpful if you decide to rewrite, respond to the comments, 
and not to them, unless it's rejected with a particular condition that they will tank it. Most of the time, it's just a rejection, but with comments as to why. Uh, and then you can use it and, and improve the piece. So it's sort of a free good for waiting this time. Most of the time, if you survive, it will be either an acceptance, a clear acceptance with no comment is extremely rare, a clear reject, or the most common, resubmit with the following comments, or a category that Joseph Weiler invented, category four, has promise but needs a general overhaul. <laughs> but it's each old. Okay, I'll go. Uh, and then they'll give you instructions on what the general overhaul means. And then it can take four to six months for a final decision. And after revisions uh, and it's accepted, it goes into the pipeline, which can take some further months. Result, it could take a year from the initial submission to the final publication. The good news is, uh, EGIL does let you uh, publish in pre-draft form, that is in not the final edited form. By the way, not all journals do that anymore. Some of them are clamping down on SSRN. By the way, SSRN is just one example. They will typically say SSRN, or your university, or some university's website as a working paper. And then you get the piece out into the world, and you don't wait 12 months. And then uh, the, what EGIL does do is they give you, every so often, uh, a little column on vital statistics where they show you where they're publishing, what the regions uh, of the places that they're getting from, English speaking, or gender of authors. So that level of transparency is there, but not so much the dates. And even I could not extract from them just how many submissions they actually receive. That's apparently classified information that no one gets. Agile is a bit more transparent. So at the time, and this was a few years ago, I checked they were receiving 400 plus submissions per year. I think that has gone up. Exclusive submissions are not required, but uh, if you say to Agile, this is an exclusive submission, this is incredible, we were not able to do this, but the current editors in chief guarantee that they will review it and you will get an idea within one week, maximum two, of whether the article is selected for peer review. That is remarkably fast and obviously desirable. And then uh, if uh, you do that, they will probably extract from you exclusive submission. Uh, and then decide to send forward to a double blind review consisting of those 28 editors and the senior editors, and you have to get an acceptance from two of them. Could be any combination. Now, the secret here is if the journal co-editors in chief really like your piece, they could send it to five people on the board in the hopes that two of them will say that. But that's sort of cheating, but they can do that, right? Because the board is very, very strict. Yes? So the editors? So the editors are not different from the reviewers, right? So it's from this, the pool of editors that the reviewers yes, for the peer yes, review are being see selected. Who they are. Okay. So, so that's why it's important to do your homework, mm -hmm. right? Whereas EGIL, I think, sends it to a lot of people. Here in Agile, it's for type. Okay. It doesn't mean that they won't send it to an outside person, but that you need two from that group. Got so it. if they look out in their board and nobody's an expert on AI mm -hmm. regulation, they could decide in addition to the two, somebody out there. Mm -hmm. So this is a typically Agile, a typical Agile uh, right. procedure. But in general, you would say that the reviewers are the same as the editors, like for most journals, or they're, they're outside? I really don't know. I haven't double checked a lot of journals. So I'm giving you this as two different models. Mm -hmm. And I suspect they'll fall into one or the other. Outside editors, whoever Joseph Weiler uh, wants uh, to review the piece, whereas this is a more closed system with an occasional outsourcing. 
Um, and then what you get, and here the two affirmative, and that's two additional weeks. That's not very long. So you've got you know, a couple of weeks at the beginning, peer review, two weeks, and then you get a result. So that's much, much faster. Um, and, you, and even if it is rejected, you will get feedback, just like you would an angel. Uh, that is, you get sometimes extensive comments from the people who reviewed it, which will be helpful. And of course, you will get it also because typically they will ask for revisions before a final acceptance, or it's conditioned on, uh, uh, on that. OK, so that's age old. Here are the numbers, um, and this is for that particular period. So you see where I got 400 for the year, because in six months there were 195 manuscripts. And here's the depressing statistics. That is, acceptance out of that, clear acceptance was 1.5%. Accept after revised submit, 2, 10%. Reject after board review, 17 and reject after uh, editor review. At the very beginning, the cleaning process, that's 100 <laughs> OK? So the pipeline is here. <laughs> Rapidly in two weeks, it goes to there. And then that little process of horror. Um, and then, so what are the common reasons? This, I think you would intuit. But here they are. Wrong subject. Wrong audience, that's the first 200, 175 of them. Lacking in novelty, we've seen this argument before. How boring. Wrong style, wrong format, wrong length. That is, you didn't follow the instructions. This is 40,000 words. You really expect us to publish this sucker? That should be a book. Go to Oxford. So, or too short. Inadequate preemption check. Did you really read everything on the subject? No, you didn't, did you? Because you ignored five prominent authors, all of whom are pointed out by the reviewers who had read those authors and were wondering whether you're one of them. And if you're not, and your name was excised, why you didn't consider that, right? Um, Insufficient engagement with the relevant in methodological weaknesses. You didn't support your argument. Implausible thesis. Um, failure to answer predictable counters to that thesis. This is all familiar lawyerly talk, right? That is, did you anticipate those arguments, uh, which are for predictable, and did you try to answer them? Poor writing, awful writing sometimes. Uh, have you ever heard of this idea of a topic sentence with a paragraph that follows? This is old-fashioned English composition 101. And surprisingly few people do it. You know what does it well? Chat GBT. They may make stuff up, but it's beautifully written. OK, I tried this with an old exam. Old international law exam. I gave it to Chat GBT. Out pops. Hallucinations, you won't, in general, some of the resolutions that didn't exist, but beautifully written. Topic sentences flowing. It got to be OK, uh, premature submission. OK, nobody workshop this. You didn't anticipate the problems. And therefore, this is a reason to show your paper to your best friends, and hopefully maybe a professor. Uh, who will give you comments and workshop it. That's what workshop it means. And then there are reasons that are out of your control. Curatorial, that is, you don't realize it, but we have five articles on that same subject. They're very different from what you have, but we can't publish five <coughs> long C pieces uh, since we only publish two lead articles at a time. Uh, and so that's curatorial reason that's not in your control. And they'll probably tell you that we just not uh, interested in that subject at this time. Angel has tips for authors located there. And there are actually a couple of YouTube videos of former editors or people who have served on the editorial board who are uh, there for you to see. And then what are the kinds of things you will get on the comments? 
uh, also follows from all these reasons. These are the comments. You need more research on X. You need to have relevant literature on Y. Uh, you need to express arguments, bad grammar, a greater attention paid to counter arguments. And then after request for resubmission, uh, they have given you these comments and you sent it back. You didn't pay sufficient attention. You didn't answer the arguments. Then you get a rejection, right? And that's, those are totally predictable uh, things that happen. And then facts and fictions. So most articles in Agile are written by academics. That is true. Uh, some common exceptions, though, to that, that is they may be co-authored by student research assistants. So that may be an opportunity for those of you who are students to get in the journal even before uh, you are an established academic. Book reviews are also something of an exception. Case comments are something of an exception, where sometimes it is someone who is not an academe or is a, a, a student. Uh, largest percentages of authors still are US or UK in Asia. Most popular topics, and this varies, but I think these remain some of the more popular topics in Agile. And then in between myth and truth, and those of you who are European may have views on this, and what is that there's something like European scholarship, and there's something like closer to American scholarship. So I'll give you the stereotypes. You choose to decide whether you accept this or not, Agile, by the way, is something of an exception. Because if you think of it, Joseph Wilder is sitting in New York, but he's also sitting in every other country on Earth because he has an academic position associated in Europe, but never mind, everywhere. So, he, so Agile, sometimes you pick up a copy of Agile, and it looks like a copy of Agile. Uh, but if you pick up some other journals in Europe, you might see some of these stereotypes. Europeans are more in international law now, are a bit more interested in constitutional international law. That is, they're heavily influenced by the European system and the Constitution. So you might see pieces that read, oh, say, the UN Charter as a constitution, whereas <clears throat> in the United States, where realism carries a bigger thrust, you won't see that. Too much. In other words, there's a certain idealism attached to constitutional law pieces in international law that many people associate with Europeans. Um, there is less interdisciplinary scholarship, or as the Europeans would call it, interdisciplinary dabbling. So the Europeans think that those of us without a PhD in political science have no reason, or no real reason, to try to publish something in law and political science because we'll get one of those things wrong, either the law part or the political science part. Whereas a good chunk of what is published in student edited journals and even in Agile is interdisciplinary. And I would say that the best of that is a co-authored piece by a political scientist and a lawyer, or a sociologist and a lawyer, or an economist and a lawyer or somebody that has a PhD in, economic, in, in economics as well as a JD. But there is something to the difference, I would say, in the views of a lot of people. And there is also a sense that the European scholarship tends to be a bit more doctrinal, black letter analysis, description, and sometimes rather didactic. This is obviously the American in me criticizing that there's a rule and there's an answer. And this is the right answer. End of story. Okay? I won't mention particular scholars in, 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 in what you who publish that kind of piece, but it's not as accepted in the American Academy because we hear a story like that and our intuitive reaction is really. What about them, right? That is, the certainty of interpretation. Now, it could be certainty of a policy implication, yes, but certainty of a legal implication, of a legal reading of a rule, is more something that you would see uh, among Europeans. Okay, 
Um, so what do uh, editors of peer-reviewed journals like Angel value? Well, one way to see is who they give awards to. So they give an award to a younger author almost every year. These are two of the more recent ones, so you can see what they look like. Julian Arado has a private law critique of international investment law, in which he basically says, international investment law has a particular view of corporations <coughs> law, contract law, and other domestic law subjects that are at odds with corporation law, uh, and so forth. And that was a, a, a rather original take on criticizing a heavily criticized regime. So just doing that, the preemption check alone to make sure you've covered the waterfront on critiques of investment law will take you years uh, to come up with a novel critique. So that's a hard topic. And you had Jane, who is now on the board of magically Angel and Egel. <coughs> okay, almost the only person right now on both because she has a position in an American law school and also, at the time, EUI. So she's on both. She published Manufacturing Statelessness, which is an interesting piece on how states' own policies and laws render people stateless. And it was not a heavily examined idea uh, of that. And then the topics are Perennial revisitations of the 38, uh, Article 38 sources of international law. Recent examples of Theo Roberts on custom, B.S. Chimney on custom, Kirsch on the decline of consent. And then uh, foreign relations law is a part of HL. So this is the constitutional part of international law in the US Constitution. And that is included in international law in HL. And that is uh, a, 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 a perennial topic. Reinterpretations of legal terms of art. So the, the recent piece, uh, just April of 2024, the countermeasures of others. That is, now that we have so many frequent assertions of countermeasures, can other people, can other states collaborate in that? And by the way, that's going to be a hot topic for years to come, because sanctions are a hot topic. So now you've got to have a lot of uh, a lot of literature, I think, on economic sanctions, the gallery of unilateral ones, and various aspects of sanctions measures, given what has happened with uh, Ukraine, especially. Doctrinal evaluations of state practice, um, those are two examples, and understudied current developments, which is much more descriptive. So you will see uh, an essay like this one which is basically a description of the ombuds person to uh, the sanctions regime under the UN Security Council described uh, in 2023. What is other things, and I know I have to speed up because we're at the end. Um, so this is the enduring appeal of legal theory and method. So this is very American, that is how we like to see theory. Uh, some of these are very old fashioned theories, uh, but some are the hot ones. So the hot ones are in red uh, because they're representative of some 10 people on the board of Agile. Um, and uh, some of the uh, names of the famous authors of these critiques, feminist critiques, general critical uh, theories, uh, Twail, uh, Twail-infused histories are there. Uh, and then the perennial on economics or rationalist approaches, game theory, uh, some of those authors. Interdisciplinary scholarship uh, that is not law and economics, law and philosophy, law and sociology, law and religion. Uh, uh, some there empirical methods where you take a lot of uh, a lot of data and you analyze it. A global administrative law and other public law theories, comparative international law. The, the idea that there isn't a single way of thinking about international law, but that it varies from country to country or region to region and lots of uh, scholarship on that. Global constitutionalism, global institutionalism. And then you have, if, you, if some of these things don't sound familiar, you might want to look at the Symposium on Method, done on the Pollock's book on international legal theory. And then again, they put out interdisciplinary perspectives. And most of these things are discussed with authors attached. It's a good idea. 
uh, even if you don't think you're going to do a deep dive on any one of these, to be familiar with those, because frequently it will have some impact on some part of it. Uh, it will also make you sound much more intelligent. <coughs> so name dropping. So for uh, this, we can pursue this on our own. But how many of you, any of you other than one, is a PhD type person interested in a book? This is uh, a particular uh, art because you cannot expect to convert your dissertation into a publication. They were meant for different audiences. Uh, it sometimes takes uh, several statements of that to convince a PhD candidate that they're carefully five-year effort needs to be rewritten for publication. And one favorite question is, well, what's the proportion of material to footnotes? If you tell me they're about equal, I'm telling you it shouldn't be published. Because they're equal because at the dissertation stage, you want to show the people who doubt you preemption check, and you have read everything on the subject. The average reader does not want that. They want two references, not ten, or discursive footnotes where you've written a little separate book in there. Okay, And that's just one example of why things have to be rewritten for a publisher. And then, of course, the publishers do have a questionnaire because they're fundamentally lazy. And what you will discover in the questionnaire is that you will be doing all their work for you, for them. This is where you provide them with the abstract of the book. This is why this is an important book. These are the people who will write the blurbs for that book. These are the target audiences for that book. Everything is here for them. And frequently, it'll show up on the book without anything, because the publishers are frequently not doing anything these days. So they're not worth your trouble. Unfortunately, they do hold the cards if you are an institution that says you must publish in a commercial publisher. Oh, and that brings me to the last thing that I want to say, which is relevant not just for these people. Oh, so this is the. Uh, the choices you make, again, is relevant for you, but maybe not for others. Uh, and then well, how do you choose a publisher? Those are some of the things you would consider. Uh, for In preparation for this, I did interview several of the publishers to find out what they're interested in. And of course, even though they purport to be like Oxford University Press, supposedly non-commercial, they want to know there's an audience. They want to know who is, this, uh, who is this going to be of interest to uh, the market reach, editorial support that they might provide? And then you have CUP's seven tips, uh, which is also I gave you, uh, which is these are the, the, the types of things that they will uh, ask for. Uh, that is, what's the competition for the book? What is the length of it? and you can find their tips at that stage. And all of this turns out to reflect, so this is my last book, and everything that I answered in the OUP comes back to haunt you in this very carefully crafted abstract of the book, which says in the first paragraph, why is this important, and what the hell is CEDAW, because some of my colleagues think that is the sale of goods convention. No, it's not. It's the, it's the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women. But most of my colleagues don't know that. Uh, but it was too long to put in the cover. Uh, and so you, that's the first paragraph. And the second paragraph tells you, unlike murder mysteries, the bottom line. What is the conclusion? Imagine a murder mystery, the butler did it right there. That doesn't happen, but in this kind of book, you tell them straight out. And then the third paragraph, what's the broader significance? Why even if you don't interested in property rights, or even women, why you might want to be interested in it? Then, two quotes from your best friends, 
who will write nice blurbs. Uh, Oxford does not produce that for you. You have to solicit it then, and that's it. Very short biographies. You have to find a cover, because Oxford's choice is to give you an abstract painting that makes it look like every other book. And so if you want something that connects to the content, you have to fight for it. So this is a painting by a very famous um, uh, Kenyan artist uh, who is, uh, has, a, uh, has exhibits all over the world, when she Mutu, uh, and, uh, and we pleaded with her uh, for this particular painting permission. Oxford wanted to give her $100 for the intellectual property rights, which is a vast insult for an artist of this type. So I had to write a pleading letter explaining that this is not an airport read, uh, and that therefore, uh, please, please, it connects to your commitment to African futurism and your commitment to equality, and she consented. So uh, that's how we got the cover, and of course, her credit is there. Um, what else can I tell you? Needless to say, they don't do, Oxford doesn't do any of this for you. Uh, the most they did is they took the painting and put it there. Okay, and that took months. Um, and, uh, and that's all I want to say. I will stay a few minutes for questions. Uh, but thanks for showing me.